Hello and welcome to Power Up Hawaii, where Hawaii comes together to walk towards a clean, renewable, and just energy future. I am your host, Raya Salter. I'm a clean energy attorney, clean energy advocate, and community outreach specialist. I'm also the principal attorney of Imagine Power LLC. Today, we're gonna to take a look at important energy and utility news from Hawaii, around the country and the world as reported in the last week. So let's go ahead and take a look at some recent developments and clean energy and clean energy policy in Hawaii. And there is always so much going on in clean energy in the islands. The biggest thing probably happening for anybody who watches ThinkTech would definitely be that Verge 2017 kicked off today at the Hilton Hawaiian Village. So Verge happens each year in partnership with the Hawaii State Energy Office. And it has come back to Hawaii to try and move the conversation forward, the conversation about the state's transformation to a clean energy future. So we've got Asia Pacific Clean Energy Summit is the focus. And we're gonna take a look at how the technology itself can help the state achieve its ambitious mandates for 100% renewables by 2045 while making the economy more robust and resilient. So I think a lot of everyone's gonna be at Verge. Everyone is always at Verge every year. Last week I spoke, I think, twice at Verge. Um, there's always a lot of exciting things that happen. You get new tech companies. I think it's neat this time we're gonna have a focus on the technology itself. You know, I'll go ahead and say, you hear rumblings. People are like, gosh. Yet another conference is it going to be the same crew all coming around together to talk about the same stuff. In my experience, no. Verge is exciting. Folks come in from all over the world to see how Hawaii is leading on clean energy. Um, the state energy office uh, makes sure that everybody who's anybody's there. In fact, I'm here. I'm missing Verge. So we'll see what comes out of Verge this year. One of the technology companies that's actually going to be featured at Verge is Maui-based Hive Energy Systems. So I think this is a cool story. Um, we've got a, a company that's coming forward with what they're saying is a, a fully integrated energy storage system for commercial and residential use. So the residential storage system is designed to store one full day of energy needs, the company said in a statement. So combined with a rooftop uh, uh, PV system, the system enables customers to eliminate monthly utility bills. Hive recently installed its first resi residential system on Maui after it received approval from uh, the PUC. So in a quote from Hive, Hive's battery storage systems are the ideal solution for any off-grid or grid-tied residential application. So this is from the CTO of Hive. Now, the storage system does not require solar energy. It can also be used with wind or any type of renewable energy source. Hive also installed its first commercial battery storage system on Maui. The 500 kilowatt hour unit could, in combination with the 140 kilowatt PV system, deliver energy free of natural fluctuations that occur during the day or after sunset, the company said. Why is this so important? Why am I bringing you news of one company based on Maui that's moving some storage forward? We've talked about this a lot on this show. We know we had the end of the net metering program, which was really a great deal for those who could afford to or just had the, the will to get involved in reducing their energy bill and using, using solar and being able to sell the, to their excess energy back to the utility at the retail rate, which was the exact same rate that that person would pay. This created some real bill savings for a lot of folks. We've talked here about the controversy about that, and I think studies have shown that in places like Hawaii, where there is a tremendous amount of PV, um, rooftop residential PV penetration, because of the high energy prices, it can create some inequities in terms of wealthier folks taking advantage of those programs and other folks remaining on the grid and having to pick up those costs. The utility also claims that there are services that they provide to those customers that, aren't, that they aren't compensated for. Those on the other side, however, they'll say a, a, several different things in defense of net metering and in defense of um, residential solar. A, we need to have um, private actors, the private market and residents be a part of this clean energy revolution. Uh, folks have the right to generate their own energy if they so choose. And we need solar energy, we need solar power in order to get off fuels. 
So we've had this debate, what happened in Hawaii? They shut down the net metering program, as we all well know, and they came up with these two grid and self-supply programs, and we're going to talk a little more about that, and we've talked about it in the past. But these programs, both of which are capped, um, at, at which the state has tried to address, have had some problems. They've had some problems in finding a configuration that will work, finding a configuration, perhaps not that will work, that will work for everybody, including the permit officers. Um, so it is, uh, and also we've talked about this in the context of the tremendous competition that's happening in the battery industry right now. Uh, this technology is coming forward. It's just about, I think it's, it's showing that it's ready to, to take folks' energy load on their shoulders. And we'll talk a little bit more about that, the certainty about these technologies and what it means for the reliability of the grid writ large. We'll talk about that a little bit later in the show, too. So we've got this technology that's coming forward, becoming more reliable, getting less expensive. However, still expensive, still untested, and you've got a bunch of companies from Tesla and many others who are competing hot and heavy in this market to provide battery solutions, and it is happening here in Hawaii here if not more or first than other places. So the, when a company comes forward with a solution that they can get approved, uh, it's a big deal. It's something that we should take a look at in the context of the bigger picture. Um, let's see, of course, what we want is the integration of more clean energy. We want customers to have flexibility and power to make energy choices and reduce their energy bills if they so choose or go off grid if they so choose. However, we need to make sure that the rest of the folks on the grid including low to moderate income, don't end up holding the bag and also see clean energy and the benefits of clean energy and the benefits of rate relief. Boy, that's a lot to say. But these are issues we talk about all the time on the show. So cool, let's watch Hive Energy and how it performs, just like we're watching Tesla on Kauai to see how it is going to perform. So more about this issue is in this next story. So. Hawaii Energy Industry Stakeholders and the City and County of Honolulu Department of Planning and Permitting have been working on improving the process for battery storage permits. And according to reports, it has paid dividends. So Hawaii Energy Stakeholders and the City and County um, have been working on improving this process, um, and they've been meeting to make it happen. Um, and so they say, Battery storage permits are being approved at a much faster pace here. So this is what the Hawaii Solar Energy Association is saying. Elemental Accelerator, the Distributed Energy Resources Council of Hawaii, and HSDA collaborated on the effort to improve the permitting process. So last month, the number of PV uh, systems with battery storage permitted by the department reached a new record, according to an analysis of data from the department. Of the 163 PV permits issued on Oahu in May, 13 included battery storage permits. So the quote is, after the involvement of a number of parties, it would appear that the permitting department has begun to open the gates to allow more battery systems to be installed, says ThinkTech's own Markle Mangosdorf um, of Hilo-based Provision Solar, who conducted the analysis. So, with over 600 battery-based customer self-supply PV systems in the HECO pipeline as of late last month, and only around 40 of them approved for operation, there remains a substantial disconnect between sold and permitted customer self-supply systems. So we talked about this story before, too. We've got, uh, I think it was just last week, actually, there is a glut with permitting. I mean, there's some may argue there's often been a glut in terms of getting um, clean energy projects all the way through the approval process, but there's been a real glut and per a real sort of blockage of permitting for the storage aspects. Now, of course, if we're in the grid supply or self-supply program, odds are you're going to have a storage component because this is actually going off the grid. You're going to need storage for when there are there's what the other story calls natural fluctuations at different times of day and at night. So you kind of have to have a way to account for battery plus PV or wind or, or energy efficiency or whatever else somebody wants to have on that system. Uh, so what's been happening, as, as the article says, is that the, um, the PV, I, I, I think what has really been happening according to folks I've been talking to, you know, folks are used to the specs on the PV. They're used to how they perform. They've got 
you know, industry warranties that they've come to understand. The folks at the permitting office are not expected to be the, you know, AC, triple E scientists who are figuring out whether the stuff is going to be good or safe. Um, so here comes these battery um, systems, uh, battery systems, some of them with one. I think the word I heard was that some of them were being put with, with sort of an, an excess of battery storage, if you want to say, um, more than one system that I think caused some head scratching amongst the folks at the permit office. So we've had these uh, projects come forward wanting to participate in these programs and they can only get one piece of the project approved and that's gotta be really frustrating when you feel the clock is running on your investment and you wanna get moving and participate in this program and clear this queue. So according to the story, we've still got a long queue when it comes to these programs, but with the help of Elemental Accelerator and other stakeholders, the folks who do the batteries, the group that works with the solar, looks like they're coming together to help grease those wheels. And I think that's great. Um, it's good when stakeholders can uh, come together. Let's just always make sure. Um, I, I, just, I just always want to say, I think so many good things happen when stakeholders come together to um, grease wheels and to, to help with blockages and, and, and move things forward. But I think I'm just always going to be that person who says, OK, where is that low-income stakeholder? Where is that? Um, uh, where is that stakeholder that uh, has something has a stake? We're just even a residential customer. Um, that's what I'm about, and it's not the fault of these groups that we may not have those people at the table. But we need to get those folks to the table more and more often, and I think we'll have more equitable results uh, as we move forward with policy. So the next story, which I'll talk just a little about before we get to the break. Looks like that we all know that the Trump administration has been not so bullish on clean energy, but it looks like it is still going to come forward with at least $12 million on ocean power. Folks think that ocean power can compete in the big leagues with wind and solar. Um, wind and solar power are the heavy hitters of the global clean energy revolution, but the US DOE is still focusing an eyeball on ocean power, and things just got a little more interesting. We're going to talk about this more when we come back um, after this break for Power Up Hawaii. Please join us. Welcome to Sister Power. I'm your host, Sharon Thomas Yarbrough, where we motivate, educate, empower, and inspire all women. We are live here every other Thursday at 4 p.m., and we welcome you to join us here at Sister Power. Aloha and thank you. Hello everyone, I'm DeSoto Brown, the co-host of Human Humane Architecture, which is seen on Think Tech Hawaii every other Tuesday at 4 p.m. And with the show's host, Martin Despang, we discuss architecture here in the Hawaiian Islands and how it not only affects the way we live, but other aspects of our life, not only here in Hawaii, but internationally as well. So join us for Human Humane Architecture every other Tuesday at 4 p.m. on so welcome back to Power Up Hawaii, where Hawaii comes together to walk towards a clean, renewable, and just energy future. I'm your host, Raya Salter. We were just talking about ocean power. It seems that despite the negative outlook from the federal folks right now in the Trump administration on clean energy, and despite the threat of steep budget cuts proposed by President Trump, the Department of Energy is forging ahead with a new round of $12 million in funding for ocean power projects specifically aimed at accelerating the development of game-changing, low-cost wave energy converters. So, the 12 million is a giant step up from the first iteration of the wave energy program, which launched back in 2015 with a 2.25 million pot in the form of the Wave Energy Prize Challenge. So, uh, there's a, you know, this article is not, this, this news story is not specifically about Hawaii, but of course it would not, you know, probably stretch anyone's imagination to realize that the potential that wave energy would have for Hawaii and the islands of Hawaii. Now the Obama administration had put forward some some tests, I think a pilot pilot is what they called it, project on wave energy here. I think we've got some of the best researchers. Uh, offshore wind is something that's been talked a lot about here and I think it's it's Hawaii is a sort of clear and obvious spot to try and figure some of these challenges out. This, this money, however, does seem to be 
coming forward with an eye towards the Northeast. So according to this article, um, wave, uh, wave power has a, has a tremendous potential to provide energy to the East, the Northeast in particular. So I wanted to be sure to mention this story in that you know, if we're going to be beefing up on wave energy, I would like to think that uh, projects in Hawaii and researchers in Hawaii will continue to be on the forefront of that. And that, of course, is so important. Think Tech talks all the time about Hawaii as how important science is to Hawaii and having world-class science that addresses the challenges the islands face that can go on also to help the rest of the world. So in general, for clean energy, it's good news that we've got this wave project moving forward. Uh, we know the Trump administration is looking to cut back on the Office of Clean Energy Res uh, Research and Energy Efficiency. I think it's a terrible mistake. I think it's worth noting here that, you know, they talk about solar and wind being the big dogs. We don't know, we don't truly know what types of technology could come forward that could continue to transform the landscape. I think one of the things that's neat when you talk about, when you look at sort of a curve and um, when they talk about grid parity for solar, meaning that solar power is starting to go at or below the price, the current sort of standard price of, of traditional coal generation. And you look at that curve, and if you look at that curve along a timeline, I've seen ones, a Deutsche Bank study from two years ago, they've got this sort of line, this drop in that curve, and they call it the innovation, the innovation. So we can't necessarily predict the things that are coming forward. And while it's been residential solar has been big and in large part due to net metering and other subsidies that have created this market and created a lot of awareness, um, wind, um, offshore wind, wave energy, there's a lot that could come forward to help um, find the solutions that we need for our energy challenges. So that's just sort of a neat thing. In fact, as an attorney, I've often, I've started to think that we need to have more creative clauses in some of these, um, some of these contracts because, you know, there's a risk, of course, of locking in a price. But if the innovation curve is, 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 is eminent, query if that's something that isn't valuable enough that the parties could think about allocating. Um, so that's just, that's sort of something I've been thinking about. And since we're talking about finance, I've just got a quick story about the Bank of Hawaii. Um, Bank of Hawaii has reduced its position in Consolidated Edison in New York by 2.5% during the first quarter, according to its most recent Form 13F filing with the SEC. So the fund owned 16,533 shares of the utilities provider stock after selling 419 shares during the period. So Bank of Hawaii's holdings in Con Ed were worth over a million dollars at the end of the most recent quarter. So why am I talking about what bank of what, what what's in Bank of Hawaii's portfolio? Well, as you know, I came here from the New York City area. I used to work in Con Ed, Con Edison's legal affairs department. So when I see that type of tie, you know, it's something that is going to catch my eye. And I think I wanted to bring it up because it's just important for us to realize how interdependent and global our economies are. Um, it's, you know, be it, I mean, of course, this is, you know, Bank of Hawaii's portfolio, but it, it, it says a lot, I think, about utility stocks. Not, I'm not trying to make any, any statement about Con Ed's stock and how it's faring, but traditionally, uh, utilities have been a pretty safe bet, um, and it's always important to keep our eye on the landscape in terms of the investors. Investor-owned utilities is this business model that we're engaged in in most jurisdictions. So look, keeping our eye on the investors, keeping an eye on portfolios, and just putting in a little, a little flag, a little marker at how interdependent we all are. So I didn't realize when I was sitting in Manhattan in legal illegal affairs department eating a awesome Reuben sandwich from Katz's Deli with a pickle and french fries, that the Bank of Hawaii was, was, was um, uh, part of the portfolio and that I would soon be here enjoying my poke. <laughs> so speaking of flying from coast to coast, something I thought that was worth mentioning that talks about energy and also the natural environment. So a lawsuit has been launched to stop Hawaii's airport, Harbor Lights, from killing rare seabirds. 
So conservation groups today filed a formal notice of intent to sue the Hawaii Department of Transportation for failing to prevent bright lighting at state-operated airports and harbors on Kauai, Maui, and Lanai from causing injuries and death to three species of critically imperiled seabirds. So the Newell's Cheerwater is a threatened species, and Hawaiian petrels and band-rumped storm petrels in Hawaii are endangered species. According to today's notice from, uh, ah, excellent, Hui Ho'o Ma'alu i Ka'aina, Conservation Council for Hawaii and the Center for Biological Diversity, represented by nonprofit law firm Earth Justice, the department's failure to protect these native seabirds from harmful operations at its facilities violates the Federal Endangered Species Act. Since ancient times, Hawaiian fishermen have looked to the, this particular bird, Newell Shearwater, to help them find fish, said Kauai fisherman Jeff Chandler. This is from the group that works to protect um, cultural and natural resources. They're an important part of our culture, and the Department of Transportation needs to take seriously its responsibility to protect them. The seabirds circle the bright lights at the department's facilities until they fall to the ground from exhaustion or crash into nearby buildings. Bright lights have contributed significantly to the catastrophic 94% decline in the population of threatened newel shearwaters on Kauai since the 90s. They have also harmed endangered Hawaiian petrels, whose numbers on Kauai have plummeted by 78% in the same period. So, you know, this is always, you know, of course, this is light. You know, as an energy person, sometimes the world of, you know, what the technology can do to the natural world can become an afterthought, or as a dealer and M&A person, that frustrating thing that's stopping a deal from going through, gosh, those turtles, or gosh, whatever, and we're trying to sell billions of dollars worth of, you know, assets to, to we're trying to, big things are changing hands, and, you know, the, the surge to get things done is real, but it's extremely alarming that the bright lights are killing these these birds, these endangered birds, and it sounds like a 94% reduction in the incidence of this one bird is tragic. Um, according to this article, these lights, there is a way to mitigate these issues. Now, I can only imagine that the bright lights at the airport, especially on an island like Kauai, that doesn't have you know a lot of lights at night, have to be super important for the for for the air you know air travel. So, you know, I'd like to think that this is something that could be addressed and we could mitigate how this technology um, works with the natural environment. And I think that it's really, really important that renewable energy um, uh, technologies in particular seek to, um, seek to be at harmony with the natural environment uh, more and more because it is not a trivial issue um, that, uh, that technologies can harm uh, it will can you know poison um, poison the water and the earth that it can harm animals. This is not a trivial issue, and if we're going to have more distributed assets, we need. To, I personally think we need to see. Uh, we've all just gotten so used to seeing these utility poles and wires. We need to move them away from our landscapes. Imagine if Hawaii had not um, put told folks they couldn't put big billboards up. Imagine what the drives around the island would look like if, if the advertisers had their say. Horrible. We are, we live without those signs. What would it be like if we could live without all that other ugly infrastructure? When we went hiking, we weren't constantly hiking to old pieces of, of, of rusty old infrastructure. Um, those wouldn't be our landmarks anymore. Those can start to retreat into the background. So if we're going to have more distributed energy resources, I think we need to be thinking about these technologies as more than clean energy for clean energy's sake. But do they work in harmony with the environment? Are they eyesores? Can they perhaps even enhance a vista or a landscape um, or the health of a particular area or community? So I think it's a big deal if, if lights are um, hurting the animals, and I hope to be able to report that there's been some kind of solution found. Um, all right, Earth Justice, bring it to them. I think we've got time for at least one more story. Um, this is not about Hawaii in particular, um, but it is about Hawaii, and it's uh, a study done by researchers at UA. So, rising temperatures and humidity will make the world's tropics increasingly unlivable, 
by pushing more people to the threshold of their physical tolerance and beyond, a new international study finds. So as of 2000, about 30% of the world's population lived in regions where the climate exceeds deadly threshold levels based on temperature and relatively, uh, relative humidity levels for at least 20 uh, days a year, uh, said researchers public publishing the Nature Climate Change Journal Estimates. So even if we do the best we can to avert climate change and reduce greenhouse gas emissions, that share will rise to about 48% by the end of the century. And if business as usual continues, it could climb to 74%. So UH is saying, you're going to have people cooking because we're not going to have any possibility to cope with this increase in heat. So this is Camilla Mora, paper's lead author and an associate uh, professor in the Department of Geography at UH. So what is going on here? Basically, they're saying, remember, guys, it's not only rising seas, it's rising the hot pools here in the islands, for, for example, that are um, created because temperatures have been rising in certain parts of the water off, um, off the island is a harboringer of things to come. Folks, it gets hot. Who does it bother most? Of course, the cakey and the old, our old folks. And it's coming for the rest of us, too. Uh, air conditioning is expensive. It can only do so much. So a big part of resiliency is figuring out how can we keep ourselves cool? It's going to get hotter and hotter. Uh, folks here um, aren't, uh, you know, it doesn't, isn't hot here like it can be in other parts of the world, like in the Caribbean where the sun can really, really bake you. But this is something we are all going to have to, um, uh, we're all going to have to deal with. I'll say a quick word about the next story, um, which is something that could help us deal with it. So folks are getting more and more interested in grid integrated um, hot water heating. So um, right now, most of us have, many of us have gas or electric um, powered hot water heaters in our house. And that's actually a big part of what we use electricity for. So those hot water heaters don't have to just sort of live on their own powering all the time. If we can integrate them into the grid, they can be a resource. They can be uh, a resource that can be turned on and off um, and help, um, help grid operators shift energy around and create efficiencies in the way energy is dispersed in the grid. Even more so in particular in Hawaii, if we've got solar hot water heaters, potentially. Right? So folks are excited about this. Utilities on the mainland are investing in some of this AMI and some of the um, advanced metering infrastructure and some of the systems that are needed to manage all that data. And, and there's just a lot of interest in that. So let's see if we can get some of that going here too. And I think that'll just about do us from this week's edition of Power Up Hawaii. Uh, I hope that you enjoyed um, learning a little bit about what's going on in Hawaii and on around the world this week in clean energy. Thank you so much for joining. Uh, thank you so much for joining me, signing off your host, Raya Salter. Aloha and mahalo.